Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this live panel. Today we will be discussing the visual effects behind the Netflix TV show Wednesday, and especially the visual effects used for the character Thing. With us, we will be uh, having the team from Rocket Science Visual Effects. And please add your questions into the chat for the panelists so we can answer them during our Q&A session uh, during, during today's live stream. And with that, let's meet today's panelists from Rocket Science Visual Effects. Hi, Tom, John, and Kaden. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. I'm very excited to get into the behind the scenes of the Netflix TV show Wednesday. Uh, but first, it would be great if you could introduce yourself to today's audience. Um, maybe Tom? Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, Tom Turnbull. I'm the visual effects supervisor for the show. Um, and um, John? Oh, uh, I'm John Coldrick. I'm the VFX supervisor at Rocket Science uh, on Wednesday. And Caden. Caden just dropped out. Where did he go? OK. OK. I think that I'm sure I he'll be back. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let him introduce himself in a moment. Uh, so for today's first part of the live stream, we are going to, oh, hi, Caden. Uh, Sorry about that. All good. Would you like um, to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. Um, uh, my name is Caden, uh, the vis visual effects producer on the show Wednesday. Um, been working in the industry since 2015. Um, yeah, excited to talk with you all today. Thank you. Uh, so uh, for today, on um, today's live stream, on the first part, we're going to see some behind the scenes clips of Wednesday by, by Netflix and some work that Rocket Science Visual Effects has done, uh, especially on the character Think and Nero, the Scorpio pet. I knew it. Hello, Thing. <laughs> Did you really think my highly trained olfactory sense wouldn't pick up on the faint whiff of Neroli and Bergamot in your favorite hand lotion? I could do this all day. Surrender. Mother and father sent you to spy on me, didn't they? I'm not above breaking a few fingers. The fact that they thought I wouldn't find out just proves how much they underestimate me. Oh, thing, you poor, naive appendage. My parents aren't worried about me. They're evil puppeteers who want to pull my strings even from afar. The way I see it, you have two options. Option one, I lock you in here for the rest of the semester, and you go slowly insane trying to claw your way out, ruining your nails and your smooth, supple skin, and we both know how vain you are. Option two, you pledge your undying loyalty to me. When we started the show, uh, we needed a vendor who was going to take on the character of Thing. This character had to be something much more than just a visual effect. It had to be a real character. And if Thing failed in the show, probably the show would have failed. And uh, we came to Rocket Science to get it done. I've worked with Tom Turnbull for uh, quite a number of years now. Uh, in fact, he got me my break into long form uh, television and film. It's been a blast working here and when I first heard that we were going to be working on Wednesday with Tim Burton, uh, that was very exciting. Tom has really been, you know, a huge influence on my career and has taught me most of what I know about visual effects. So another opportunity to support this really interesting and innovative show um, with Tom's, you know, particular experience and insight was something I was excited to do. From the beginning, Tim had asked us to make sure that we did as much of it as the live performer as possible. Sounds easy in principle, but it's actually quite complicated. <laughs> and the paint outs that you end up having to do are not trivial, they're, they're big. But then you also have to make a 3D version of thing in order to patch up all the pieces that are 
not there. And that handbag scene is, is a really good example of that. Tim says, well, I want him to come out of the bag. He literally had to walk in behind Jenna like he's stalking her. And he did it well. He managed to get in there, get his hand into the bag, and do, his, do his thing. Did you do the bag as a 2D thing, or did you make a 3D? Was, you made a 3D uh, patch? I think it was 3D. I think we did a 3D patch. Yeah, we never built like a full asset. It was oh, a projection. Oh, not a replaced asset. It was a projection, yeah. You've got an actor who's got a prosthetic, and he's got his arm. And so you have this bent-up prosthetic that we wanted to essentially append to, but we had to alter that. Victor did an amazing job of mimicking what it would be like to crawl along a floor, keeping his balance as if this was the only thing that existed, just the hand and the wrist. Uh, but there were some shots where he's sort of a little magical, and so we would have to go in there literally and take a thumb and connect it on this frame and to go to the, that frame and put the index finger down. There's a lot more going on there than meets the eye. Yes. Yeah, yeah there is, absolutely. Yeah. It's not only removing the actor, it's how do we support the performance, how do we make it believable, how do we you know, reinforce with the environment what's going on so that it's just a hand, not a whole body. Victor had three different prosthetics that were used. Like one was more upright, one was more relaxed, and then there was one that was... A glove, virtually. Yeah, yeah. that just went right onto his wrist. But we would have to decide at the beginning of the shooting day which one we were going to use. Uh, because the amount of time it takes to change it is just like, it's a two-hour job. We had to have people who could look at an issue and not and come up with different solutions um, that aren't necessarily straightforward. And we knew we had to bridge the gap between 2D and 3D. And sometimes the solves would be um, something we try and not even know if it was going to work until we until we executed it. So there's a lot of experimentation. There's a lot of play. Little details, again, you wouldn't notice that, oh, way over in the far right corner, there's actually a little interactive shadow happening because the actor is there, but we've taken him out. And Nuke had the correct diverse set of tools. It's a standard in the industry. There was a lot required of the uh, compositing artists to even sometimes do animation that wasn't done in 3D to, again, connect or reconnect uh, fingers to floors and walls and just help tweak performances that were there in the plate. There was a remarkable number of shots where he did maintain his center of mass. And I, I was actually quite impressed with the performance. In pre-production, when we were first demonstrating the train station sequence to Tim, where we got Victor rigged up on a dolly, but they started dollying too quickly. So he just automatically went into a gallop, and he invented that move right there on the spot. And Tim was like, yeah, that's it. That's what we need. It was one of those moments. Yeah. Again, a lot more work going on there than meets the eye. That scene in particular, there was a lot of extras in behind. We had to maintain that the characters were consistent throughout, matching the continuity in the scene. Continuity, we used uh, Nuke Studio for that. We sure did. A lot, of, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of mini edits. Oh, if I'm not mistaken, there's somebody still on set that shouldn't be there. <laughs> yes, that, well, you're looking at the plate there, John. Yeah. So, you know, the 3D blend on this shot is zero because we had it in the budget and that was the plan was to actually replace the thing with 3D entirely, um, but absolutely didn't need it. In the, in the script it said the water cooler, he's hiding behind the water cooler and so that's why you're having to paint out a blue guy behind a big thing of blue water. water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My favorite part were the bubbles. Yeah. That's what really sold it, was having that element kind of come in. and If you can get it in camera. Yeah. Again, an example of like, when we looked at this shot, we were like, oh, this is going to be a pain. And it went surprisingly well. The bubbles were a big part of that. <laughs> yeah. When we originally blocked the scene, we had him actually climbing up the other leg, which meant that Victor was on top of both legs. Um, Thank you for changing that. We did change that. <laughs> Helped as much Tim, as you could. Tim was accommodating. Speed helped. Yes. Big time. Keep it moving, keep it blurred, match the plate. These leaves were super challenging to make those work because there's all the layers of shadows across it and like movement that would happen in the background that you didn't notice. Yeah, the leaves. Well, <laughs> we, we knew about the leaf problem. <laughs> but when we removed the leaves, it was actually a bigger problem because underneath that's just mud. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd have like tracks. It was not, it was not good. The people we had assembled on the team, though, I mean, they had good eyes. So it was like, you don't have to talk to the lighter and tell them to match the lighting. They'll match the lighting. That's what they do. Um, and same for comp, too. Uh, it's more about just having enough of that 
cautious eye that you're looking at every part of the screen. What would happen if he wasn't in there? And just making sure that that works. I mean, in a scene like this, it was really important to look at it in the editorial context. Um, we had to bring in the different elements, like the edit, the plates, the seeing the shots lined up together, um, being able to val evaluate them against, um, like I said, the original, um, kind of just combing through those fine details, making sure they're consistent with each other. They're not standalone shots. This character has to work across a multiple, multitude of shots to get a whole performance together. So absolutely have to get these things in context to understand what needs to be done. Yeah, the morgue scene. It was a, that was a bit of work. So that shot there, look at the two pieces. Victor's outside the set of the first one. And then we moved him inside, put him on a ladder to get up to the thing. And then miraculously it goes together. Yeah. Kind of impressed. Merging those plates, like we expected to go through multiple versions of that. And we basically had it in the first <laughs> comp. Yeah, the shot here is that's this is a good example of you know having to anchor the feet to the ground. There was a lot of performance modification in that shot. There was even I think a couple of frames where we had to re reconstruct because fingers that were behind fingers were suddenly exposed. So it's a lot of fussing and nuke. Now wait a second, how many iterations of thing jumping off this morgue table do we go through? Lots. At least ten. <laughs> that's with Tom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We were getting to the limits of what he could actually physically do. Yeah, because he had to fall on the opposite side of the table that he was actually standing on, which obviously he yeah. can't drop his hand. No. Lighting on this shot in the photocopier was a bit, uh, a bit fussy. There was a lot of banded light coming in from the blinds, blue glows from below. It was one of the fussier shots on the show for us Yeah. in terms of lighting. Well, I'm sure the paint back was not easy either because of that shelf behind him is an open shelf, so the perspective on it is actually very specific. Jumping down off, we went through a few iterations of that too. Just getting that to sort of slide down and feel correct. This is a fussy shot to light because of all the way the light is playing across his hand and all the interaction going on with newspaper clippings and all that. Yeah, I, unbeknownst to you, I had them tape them all down. Oh. I, I, I do try to help. <laughs> as long as you make an effort. Every last it. one is taped down so it can't, it can flex, but it can't move. That makes a lot of sense actually. Okay, so this is the skeleton. We didn't actually have the skeleton until the day of the shoot. And we had to cut away most of the back of the skull. There's actually a big hole back there. So Victor could pop the top like that. Doing the paint on this, you know, we had not only thing and everything else, but the, the stand and then really the like intricacies of the light interaction. And a lot of it was about, you know, his arm is blocking all this light. How we'd have to bring that back and, and make that feel realistic, which was, yeah. which was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Tricky bit of fun. <laughs> That's, a, that's about as hard a paint out as it gets. Mm -hmm. A lot of detail work. Mm -hmm. After that, there's just the shot of Jenna in the uh, drawer. We had to switch essentially from one take to another, and that amongst dry ice. The shot is actually being played in forward, and then halfway through, the only Thing's element is played in reverse. The tricky part was we had to reverse Thing while integrating all the fog to feel natural that it was still going in the right direction, not, <laughs> not reversing doing, back yeah, ping in. Pong, yeah. It's also the whole thing is a bit of a nice piece of editing and staging because if you, you accept that you believe Thing did all this stuff and Thing is real, but if you think about it, how did Thing open that drawer? <laughs> it's like, it's like you know, two feet off the ground. It's got a lever. You can't do it with one hand, even if you had two hands. I mean, you'd, you'd have to actually. It's impossible. <laughs> but nobody thinks about that stuff. Nope. Movie magic. Yeah. Rocket Science also did the Scorpion sequence, Nero the Scorpion. We, we didn't want to go too cartoony with it to start with, but interestingly enough, Tim sort of pushed us a little bit more in that direction. Tim rides this fine line between things that look real and things that have a character. So a scorpion doesn't really, you know, have a character. No. It, it just does its scorpion thing. So, but he would only make very small changes to do that. We modeled a, a photoreal scorpion and then he, he went and he said, just change this one thing here. Make these claws a little bit bigger and a little bit larger than they should be. And it was the same when he directed the, what the scorpion needed to do. We, he has to react in a way that we can understand as human beings, even though he's a scorpion. We have to be able to connect with it in order for this, this story to work. So he would, he would give us, uh, again, usually just one note. But, you know, I need more reaction time for the scorpion before uh, he turns and runs because we have to be able to read 
that he that the scorpion understands the situation and is doing what he's doing for a reason. We enjoyed the whole experience from uh, beginning to end. You know, it was a constant uh, like problem solving and you know really getting into in the nuts and bolts of you know what's fun about filmmaking and visual effects in particular. It was very much that. It was fun filmmaking and looking forward to doing more of it in season two. I think we'll be back for sure. Hi again, thank you very much for that. That was actually a very interesting material. Um, I would just like to, to remind that you guys are um, more than welcome to, to add any questions for, for the panelists, just type them on the on the chat. Um, but in the meantime, I will actually start with, with my questions because I got uh, quite a few. Um, so Tom, John, Kaden, I was just wondering, was there any specific scene that you enjoyed working the most? Oh boy, John, over to you on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the the shots that just work out really well usually are the most fun. Um, the the we, we saw that short at the beginning of the running through the vents and coming down, landing and picking at the gum on the camera. I just love the way that turned out, and I also love the fact that it was not a nightmare to work on, which that's mm -hmm. always fun. Because usually when you have a nightmare problem, it's on a shot that isn't necessarily a spectacular like little tour de force shot um but i mean i like i like that one uh, a lot um yeah. i don't know if you had any favorites caden or i mean for me it was the train station for sure i feel like you got to see so much of things character in the scene and um you know really the way it was blocked there was so much storytelling happening and really like it was all carried by a disbodied hand that we you know got to bring to life so that was that was pretty fun yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd go with the morgue scene um, myself, I think you know the, the the way that we kind of played things throughout that scene. We we had a lot of control as to how to how to shoot those sequences. I mean, Tim came in and did all of the actor action, and he pretty much left the uh, the visual effects unit to do the thing shots in that particular case. So it was it was a lot of fun getting the shots uh, to work and, and inventing things. Um, you know, and that whole idea that he has to jump from the vent down onto the camera. Uh, you know, that was, in theory, probably shouldn't have worked. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it kind of managed to get it to, in a way that, that it came together. So it was all very, that, that whole sequence is very satisfying. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. So I'm just going to start with the questions from the audience. Um, were there many clean plates taken for each set? And how did that affect the filming? Yeah, there was there was lots. <laughs> they were really well um, shot um, and provided. You know, it 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 made um, a lot of the work uh, easier for us because we were able to have that 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 reference point. Um, obviously, you know, there's still lots of challenges of where to add things in. I don't know if you had anything to add to that, John. Uh, sorry, I actually missed the opening part of the question. Uh, reference shot was it? Clean plates. Oh, clean plates. Oh, yeah, I can't live without clean plates. That's the only way the show would work. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the clean plates is part of the tool set that the, the compositor is using. They, you know, they go over it. Uh, it, it is amazing how much it, it's not some people who don't work in the industry might think it's like, oh, you just take the part there and you just sort of bring back the clean plate and you're done. But it, no, it's, there's so many little tiny details uh, that end up happening and sometimes something here is affecting something over there. And so it, it's just a lot of yeah. fussy work and good yeah. eyes. I mean, a, a good practice, you know, on set is to, is to try and shoot clean plates when you, when you can. Um, but honestly, in a lot of shots, they don't get used. They don't really, they're not really that necessary. On this show, they were pretty essential. Um, and I, I don't think there's probably a, a, a single scene we shot where the clean plates weren't used. Um, True. And also, we made this kind of broad assumption going into the, into the show that anytime we shot thing practically, we would assume that 
there's a possibility that we would have to replace them with 3D in post. So regardless of how simple the shot was, we always shot our color reference, our, our spheres, our HDRI, and clean plates. I mean, for each and every one of those thing shots, we, we did it all. Because you never knew in post-production what might change. And if you had to turn thing into a 3D uh, character, you needed to have that stuff there. So that was a little annoying to the people on set because every single time we had to stop and do all of that. Um, hopefully they won't watch this video. Find out that someone wasn't really needed. Um, okay, I'm gonna go with the next question. So how many compers worked on the hand sequence? So I guess that, I don't know if it'll be in one sequence or in the whole, or in the whole series. Yeah. There was, there was two companies who did work work on the sequence. There was a 3D the 3D work on thing was done by Mars, and all of the uh, the, the 2D shots were done by Rocket Science. And I deliberately split that up, even though there's a fair bit of crossover between them, um, because when we gave a shot to one of those two companies, it's the way we thought that it should be done. We wanted the company to be vested in that solution, because the option is. If that solution doesn't work, then it's going to the other company. Is that news to you, Caden? <laughs> <laughs> it's all part of the job. Yeah. Um, okay, another question. So how much of thing was a 3D replacement versus 2D comp? Um, well, well that, I mean, that's actually, in, in the big picture, um, I went into the show assuming that to do the 2D thing, paint outs, is, is not just a big, it's, it's fairly a big amount of work in post, but it's also a pretty big imposition on set. Um, it limits what you can block in the scene. It, um, you know, you've got a, a big guy there in a blue suit who can't block the actors and, and he's casting shadows. Um, you, you have to start cutting holes in your set so that he has somewhere to stand. It, it's a fairly big deal. And my assumption was that on most shows, you kind of go in with that, okay, this is the general principle. We're going to try and do a lot of this with a practical or semi-practical solution. And throughout the course of the show, over course, over as it plays out and everyone starts to get a handle on how complicated it is and what an imposition it is, that more and more of it goes 3D. Um, so I actually anticipated there would be more 3D in the show than there is. In reality, there's probably about 10 to 15 percent of the shots are CG, fully CG. Um, and the real reason that that happened was because um, Tim wanted it to be practical and Tim understood the limitations and he would lean into it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't just arbitrarily ask for things that can't be done. You know, clearly every once in a while you get to a shot that just could not be done practically. And, you know, we'd acknowledge that and we'd say, okay, this one's going to be CG. But he would set up the scenes and block the action in such a way that Victor could do the performance. Um, and on, on other shows that wouldn't have been there. It, it was really Tim's conviction and, and Tim leaning into it and using it for what it is that made it as successful in the 2d front as it was. Sounds great. I, I, I have to say that I personally did watch the TV series and I really, really enjoy the, the two characters uh, working together because I really kind of believe the thing was a character working with, with Wednesday in a few, in a few scenes. I thought that was great. Yeah, um, that, that first scene that you played at the beginning of this of, of Jenna talking to uh, uh, Victor, she puts him on the desk and all of that. That was the very first scene we shot um, with, with with Victor performing the role. It was also Victor's very first day on set ever acting. Um, so, you know, he kind of got dropped into, you know, uh, day one of his, his acting career was acting against across from Jenna and being directed by Tim Burton. So he, <laughs> he definitely stepped up to it. Um, I'm not quite sure how he did it without freaking out, but he did. I definitely think that he did a great job. He, he's amazing, but also you guys, because there was a comment in, in, the, in the chat when we were playing that, that scene and someone said, moving the light above think is just so enough. And I think that it, it looked, it did look very, very good. Um, um, yeah, sorry. Jump, jump in. 
Go ahead. I was just going to ask another question. Um, the next one that I was going to ask was about geometry tracking. Uh, was it done in Nuke? Oh, the geometry tracking? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm essentially, uh, we we basically used um, a, a tracking a tracking software called 3D Equalizer for uh, for the actual tracking. That's mm -hmm. imported. There's an import ability to import the files into Nuke using a plugin. Uh, but we but we primarily use that for for tracking like the wrist and the hand and all that because that's the part that we did the 3D on was like we kind of blended into the live action hand and up on the wrist that, that was us that was the rest of us yeah if there was like smaller details things like that tracking then some of that was in a nuke but anytime yeah. we had a full wrist replacement or something like that it was a 3D yeah and if obviously 2D tracking was all done in nuke. Um, there is another question. Um, so, did you guys take any inspiration from the way Think was created back in the nineties? Um, I'm going to go with yes. <laughs> um, I mean, if, if, if Thing, the whole idea of Thing being a, an independent creature and walking around on his fingers, that didn't exist before those movies. I mean, in the series, Thing was uh, an arm sticking out of a, a box. Uh, he was never, never disconnected or, or free, free moving, and, and even in the Charles, in the Charles Adams uh, uh, comics from the uh, '30s and '40s, the New Yorker ones, um, I think Thing only appears once, and, and he's kind of just again, it's just a hand coming out of a box. So the '90s invented that um, whole manifestation of things. So absolutely, we built on that. Um, we have way better technology than those guys had when they did it back then. Um, but the, the essential idea is, is the same. Uh, they were, they were, I mean, those movies were done in very early digital, so they, they were able to do paint outs and things, but they weren't really able to do 3D patches or 3D tracking. Um, I also borrowed an idea from the 90s movies, which was, uh, if you look at things prosthetic, you've got the wrist that sticks out the top. Mm -hmm. That's something that they did in the uh, in the '90s movies, and I, I think they really did it because that just made their paint outs a lot easier to achieve, um, having that stump on top. But what I discovered early on in the process, when we started doing tests with thing, is you really needed to break the connection between the hand and and the performer, and by putting that prosthetic wrist element there, uh, it it does break that connection. You now are not looking for the actor where you think the actor would be. And I, I know that sounds like a small thing, but it was that was the transformative moment when we, you know, the, our earlier tests where we were just painting out the actor, you could always see the invisible actor. It never really worked. The moment we put on that uh, prosthetic stump, it was transformative. It was, it was completely, suddenly an independent entity. So, you know, I, I'll, 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 Credit that to the to the guys in the in the nineteen nineties movies, and um, I was I was happy to steal it. I I actually personally love those movies, and I and I have seen recently some of those shots, and I think that for the time that it was made, I personally think that they were very very good. It was yeah. it was innovative in its time. It was groundbreaking in its time. Yeah. Um, it's just you know you know with with the tools we have now with Nuke and, and Nuke Studio and and. 3D tracking and all that business, we, we have we have the ability to make that effect much, much more seamless. And that that's a big part of what we were doing was which is elevating what had been done in the nineties. Mm -hmm. And I and I think we did I think we we we've, we've done a better version of them. We gave him a stronger character too. We made him more of an independent being. We we definitely on all fronts tried to bring him further along. And that's what we're gonna try and do in, in season two as well is give give uh Thing and Victor more more freedom and uh, more abilities. We've only sort of started to explore what we can do with them. I can't wait. That sounds very cool because I truly believe that there's like some kind of personality behind the kind thing, especially in the in the TV series. Like I think that you you are able to tell those things. Um, okay, I'll go with the next question. So, what is the best way to pivot from working in visual effects in that in advertising to film and TV? 
Uh, sorry, can you say that again? Yeah, of course. Uh, what is the best way to pivot from working in visual effects in advertising to film and, and television? Uh -huh. Oh, well, well I, that actually I, leads right I, into John. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so I, I started way back in the distant uh, dawn of humanity in the eight, late 80s doing architectural visualization. But from there, I got into doing commercials. And I spent a fair um, amount of time in commercials. Uh, honestly, you, you just need to get into a company that does long series format, or whether it's series or whether it's film. You just need to keep applying your skills towards getting a job in that industry because it is different it's certainly different you think differently about things but in the end you're visually telling a story right it's, it's going to be in 30 seconds so you haven't got long you haven't got a lot of shots tell your story in 30 seconds um it, it it's very i personally found it very rewarding i i don't want to put down working in advertising someone who's asking is probably in advertising and wants to know how to how to get out of it it, it was extremely educational i think of it like the soaps of acting training it's like you have to do stuff in a certain time frame very short shots very short time frame and tell a story it's good training i think it's really good training you just need to apply that into the longer format and it's also it, it's black party in the longer format telling stories the, the turnarounds in advertising are, are brutal yeah, um, yeah. and so I, I think not, not only the good things about advertising you you're definitely working on cutting edge stuff and you're doing it on a very short schedule so you kind of have a lot of uh, skills that will benefit you in long form. The biggest difference is, is that, I, I mean, a commercial, you can, from an organizational point of view, it's 30 seconds long. It's like, you know, 20, 30 shots at the maximum. Um, and you can kind of manage that in your head. Yeah. Uh, when you get into long form, you, you are now in a world where you're managing um, some shows several thousand shots. And it, it just takes a, a lot more um, a lot more uh, sort of back, back, backbone to the whole process to keep it all organized and moving forward. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to ask a question about Roto. So, did you roll to the hand too? And in some scenes where the blue guy was behind a uh, thing and all the side of going all under on top of the hand, uh, where he was in a dark room and walk over to climb the wall. How did you achieve that? I well, guess that there's actually quite there's, a few. There's not there. a there's not a shot that didn't have Roto in it. <laughs> uh, there's, the, there's the, a the blue the blue isn't there for keying really. I mean, we I would think you'd probably rarely key the blue if ever. It's uh, a yeah. signifier on set. Stuff is happening here. Yeah, you see, you, I mean, putting the guy in the blue, I mean, that actually does a couple of things. One is, is it allows you to see what it is you need to paint out. So it, it's kind of clear. Yeah. Um, but there was another usefulness to the blue suit and that um, that Victor actually exploited. Is it um, when he's on set and he has the blue suit on and he pulls the blue hood over his head, he kind of becomes a non-person um, and people stop looking at him. So he, he doesn't have a presence on set anymore. So it made the actors much more able to connect to talking to a hand. And Victor, when he acted, uh, he never was, he almost never looked at what his hand was doing. He was always looking at the actors. Um, and so if he had his hood off, that would have been pretty distracting. But with the hood on, he was able to kind of have a conversation directly with the actors, even though they were actually talking to his hand. But yeah, none of it is keyable. It's all it's all roto, and a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that actually ties. I, I think that you already have answered another another question. Uh, someone else asked, "How useful is a blue suit? Really, seems like it is just done to make people on set feel more comfortable." Bang! Good question. That's that's a good question that just got answered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's> yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so what about pre-production? How long was the pre-production schedule? Also, how long was the shooting schedule and post-production one? Prep on the show was, I think, around 16 weeks. Um, I don't really know for sure because I actually, visual effects on a lot of shows doesn't come on at the very beginning. Um, the very beginning of prep is usually about art department. So I came on, uh, I think, um, about 
eight weeks before production. That's when we started sort of planning what we needed to do um, and started working with Victor and doing tests and things. In, in terms of production, we, we shot seven months in Romania, which was a little longer than would normally be expected for that many episodes. Uh, we had some COVID issues that kind of shut us down a few times. But yeah, it was seven, seven months shooting and post-production was another uh, eight months after that. Mm, maybe seven months. But anyway, that, that's, that's, that was the timeline. And honestly, it was, uh, the entire show had, I think, 2,500 shots or close to that. And uh, we used every minute we had. Great. Um, okay, what about the scripts and automation? Since there were too many things, uh, too many things hand shots, were there any kind of automation used in the scripts? Uh, sorry, automation used in the what? In the... Uh, automation uh, in the scripts. Bec I'm assuming like if there was uh, things that you were able to use from uh, oh, one show to script. another, I'm assuming. Luke yeah, oh, I'm assuming gotcha, that, gotcha, that's the question. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> like automation, you mean like reusing, like having a sort of standard setup kind of a thing? I mean, we definitely do that all the time. If we have very similar kinds of shots, we have sort of like little scriptlets and things like that. If that's the, the meaning of the question, unless you're talking about AI. <laughs> um, but I mean, yeah, we, we would set certain types of things up and, and share them among the compositors and they would read. Yeah, particularly would... like integrating the lighting, had a common setup, things like that. Yeah. But And we have, and we have already have in our pipeline, like, the bits that came from 3D for the wrist and everything all have standard AOVs uh, that are re they rebuild essentially. We have scripts that it will rebuild all the different layers so that way they can go in and they can even change the lighting. The compositor can bring down that key a little bit, you know, over there. And so the, we save a lot of that for fine tuning and compositing. Um, so all that sort of stuff is all sort of planned out already. But every shot is um, very much bespoke. Yeah, every shot gets looked at and talked about in terms of what is the best approach for this. Um, you yeah. know, is this is this a simple paint out? Do we need to escalate it to another level? Uh, we built the projection patch. Do we need to escalate it to a three D patch, a full three D patch? Um, so there's there's definitely a every single shot has a a, a, a somewhat unique approach. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's no one size fits all. Mm -hmm. How many, uh, out of curiosity, how many shots were in the whole TV series we think, if you are able to... The number of shots of thing? You know, I never counted, but Gaten, do you know? <laughs> we worked on about 270. I was going to say uh, high 200s. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah, I mean, you, you know what, in the, in the scripts there was actually a lot more thing, uh, but, you know, we, we kind of trimmed it here and there. I think we actually ended up striking a good balance because Thing, Thing is successful in focused scenes where he, he has a real purpose to be there. And if, if he's ever in a scene where he's just sort of background action, that kind of dilutes his character. So I think we, we did keep it on the production side pretty much down to what, what does Thing have, why does Thing have to be in this scene? What does Thing learn in this scene? Or what does he contribute to the scene that carries the narrative forward? Um, but yeah, I would think that in the original script, it was probably double the amount of thing. And, you know, keeping it limited to to, to the shots we did, I think, was a, a really good decision. Yeah, I think so, too. That, that, it's sort of like having a good character actor. When in a show, they're not there all the time, but suddenly they'll crop up and you, you kind of go, oh, it's them. You know, it, it, it really like brings the spark. That's one of the things about the thing that I loved in this series was that he's this, he just brings a smile on your face. When he appears and sort of pops up, he brings a smile for me anyway, despite having yeah. worked all those shots. <laughs> um, okay, probably we have time for one or two more questions. Um, so there's another one from the audience. Um, when do you make that? When do you make that determination to keep thing as a practical element, or do a complete three D replacement? Actually, is it? Uh, 
have you have you made any complete three D replacement on the on the series? Oh yeah, okay. absolutely. I mean, even when we did three D full three D replacements, uh, we we did it. Um, we, Victor would be there, and we he he'd give us some kind of reference to work with. So we would shoot a version with him doing whatever he could do in in that if there was anything he could do. So we had something to to look at and something to edit with and and all that business. Um, but I mean, I think you know, in in episode one, there's uh, when Thing enters Tyler's room, you know, he has to run away from a from the baseball bat. He leaps up onto the dresser. He has to run across the dresser and onto the desk. That series of shots of him scampering around like that are all fully three D, um, because there was really no way for Victor to to pull that off. Um, there, there was, I mean, and, and Victor was game to do anything. I mean, when we shot the underwater sequence where he he jumps off the boat and he swims underwater and he and he punches the uh, Kent the siren, that um, we shot that in a, in a in a water tank, and Victor did all of that action, um, and actually some of it he did very well. Like and he managed to puppet underwater pretty well. We ended up replacing all of those with 3D in the end, be simply because the lighting didn't really match into the into the scene. It, it, it became more about um, just making it fit together rather than Victor able to to do the the action. But yeah, there's you know, it, it was a, it was an individual decision as to whether we needed to or not. Our go-to was, can we do it practically? If we can think of a way to do it, we will. And and if we run into trouble, or we know we can't do it. We'll, we'll go to 3D. It really came down to practical things. How how far can Victor go? Where can Victor stand? Uh, does does Victor have to fly through the air? Because you know what, it's actually hard to animate a hand flying through the air, so it looks like a there's a real trajectory. We actually did do that a few times practically, and it actually worked not too bad. Um, but there were other cases where we we knew it wasn't going to work. Um, an example where where it wouldn't work is like at one point Victor has to jump onto the table to the, onto the bumper of a vehicle. We knew that he couldn't do that in a believable way, so we made that 3D. But there's also a shot where he leaps off of a tabletop and grabs Fester by the throat, and that absolutely was done by Victor, um, and was, it was achieved practically. And what Rocket Science did on that was because Victor was doing it, he has a bit of an arc to his movement with his arm, and they kind of straightened that out. And, uh, and that's all it took to make that look believable. So it's, it's kind of those kind of things that make us make that call one way or the other. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I think that with these, we're 45 minutes into the panel. I think that probably we need to wrap up here. I just want to say that it has been an absolute pleasure, uh, pleasure Tom, John, Caden, and congratulations on the show because I really think that without Thing Wednesday, if, if Thing wouldn't have worked, I think that this show wouldn't have been the same, honestly. So um, congratulations, and, and I I just can't wait to see this, this, this season two. Great. Well, uh, likewise. I'm same here. To see what's happening in season two as well. Yes. <laughs> Um, and thank you everyone for, for watching and if you like the, the content, yes, stay on, on this channel because we'll be having these panels um, often. So um, again, uh, a pleasure. Thank you very much all for, for listening. Mm -hmm.